And just one further prayer that I'll, I'm just going to say a short prayer in regard to a, <clears throat> uh, at work this week on Monday there was a, um, a sort of the, the scattered personal effects of a homeless man um, in Caboolture and uh, I'll just reveal that his name was John but I could tell that he was um, not long out of prison. All these effects showed that he was recently released from prison. <clears throat> but amongst his personal effects was a Gideon's New Testament, Psalms and Proverbs. Um, <clears throat> I saw it there and opened it up to uh, John chapter 3 and left it there on his personal effects. So hopefully the word will come to him and he can be saved too. So Lord, we pray for this man. I'll call him John, this homeless man. This is the reason why Christ came. He came to save the brokenhearted and the lost. And we pray for this man this morning that those, the word of God seeks deep into his heart and brings him back to the loving bosom of Christ. This is our earnest prayer. For we know that there is more joy in heaven when one sheep comes back than the 99 that are already there. We pray for this man this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the, today, the, uh, it's about the Sermon of Stephen. And, and a subtitle is The Sermon of Stephen That Converted Saul. In my preparation, um, I just want to mention, just as a little icebreaker like I do, on uh, Tuesday afternoon, I was, was a group of the family was sitting at the outside table and I was, had my, the Bible and the books and all that scattered and, and there were some of the children and Jed was sort of, little Jed was there sitting next to me, fairly close, and uh, he was hard at his schoolwork, writing down his uh, letters that he had to write for his story and he looked across at me and, and he said, Dad, I bet you're not doing as much work as me. Look at you, you're just reading. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jed. <laughs> I'll aim to put in more effort next time, Jed. <laughs> All right, let's turn to Acts chapter 6. That's going to be our primary area that we're going to be drawing from, which is the uh, speech that Stephen delivered. So we're just going to go through, so just go to Acts 6, but I'm just going to give a bit of a background first. So Stephen is the first martyr of the Bible. So before we get into what led to his martyrdom, we first need to see how he was connected. There was hypocrisy in the church. So that was, um, we know that Ananias and Sapphira were dealt with um, by their death because of their hypocrisy. And then there was also the threat that was from without when Peter and John themselves were also arrested and beaten and threatened not to speak the name of Christ again. And where we're coming into, where Stephen comes into this um, as, a, as a leading up to, the church is also uh, attacked by the distractions that happen within the church. And this is all in chapter 5 where there was a dispute with the, between the widows, where the Hellenistic widows uh, amongst them were being, they were saying they were being deprived of the distribution of goods. And once again, the apostles, as an early church, they had to come together and said, we can't have these distractions from the priority of the word of God and prayer. So they selected deacons and or ministers to take care of this situation they recognised that these matters can't supersede the word of God and what must be done. So out of the seven deacons and ministers to sort out extra church needs, one was Stephen. So this is where we pick up and look at his entry. So we look at Acts chapter 6, verse 3. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, what we were just referring to. So they wanted, from verse 3 there, they wanted men that were full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. They chose only those that they knew were working by using the Holy Spirit as their guide and tutor, and Stephen was outstanding in that. We go to, uh, let's look now down at verse 8. 
in verse 8, it states, um, And so Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. So it's not just... See, this uh, point of this verse here is saying it's not just those that are standing in the pulpit. It's not just the ministers and the preachers. Everyone is involved in the ministry. Steve is involved in the work of the church. He's, as it states there, he was a deacon and he was given the responsibility of serving uh, the ladies and the, and the widows in the church. And Paul says this actually later in his letter to Timothy, that it is believers like this the way that they serve people, it will raise a good degree and boldness in their faith in Jesus Christ. So there's signs and wonders happening in, this, in his life, showing that it is never limited to preachers when their lives are full of the Holy Spirit. So he's not an apostle. He's not a gifted preacher. He's just serving in the body as part of the ministry. But, but, but God gives him his ministry and is showing favour to him. So we move on to verse 9. Then there arose some from what was, is called the synagogue of the freedmen, the Syrians, the Cyrenians, sorry, the Alexandrians, and those from Sicilia and Asia disputing with Stephen. And in verse 10, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. So he was speaking at the in verse 9 and 10, we see he was speaking at the synagogue of the Libertines. Synagogues have um, direct and certain names too, like we do, like the churches we have today. And this was the synagogue of the Libertines. It was called actually the synagogue of the freedmen. And they began, as it just said there in verse 10, disputing in religious debates with Stephen. And they started getting riled then with his ministry as a Christian and one of the members of the synagogue, who we know as Saul, and he'll come up later, he'll come sort of last in what we're speaking about this morning, and as we revealed in verse 10, and Christ was now showing favour because they couldn't resist this wisdom and the spirit, they recognised he had, the spirit was, was within him. And just to make a note here, um, just because we may, you may be on the winning side of the argument, it doesn't mean that you've won the soul. And we see this often even in Jesus' ministry. When it states he's speaking wisdom, I believe it means they could not refute what he was saying ultimately biblically. Everything he was saying biblically was true and correct and we're about to get into that in chapter 7. But he was also speaking full of the Holy Spirit. He's full of the Lord, he's full of love, and he's full of grace. And so they could not respond to that, and that riled them. And what's their response? Well, we'll see this in, in verse 11. They lay charges on him. So go down to verse 11. Then they secretly induced men to say, we've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. It, just reading that verse, it made me think of um, in, in current state of affairs that's happening around the world, speaking against things. I've, I'm aware that current hate speech laws in Britain are at this level. British police have over 900 officers employed trolling social media for hate speech. Yes, believe it or not, 900 officers just for that alone. In 2019 alone, 3,300 people were arrested for hate speech in Britain. But meanwhile, knife crime, which is prominent in immigrant um, youth in shires like Bradford and Staffordshire, they've risen by 20 to 30 per cent. And on top of that, the British police have lessened their police numbers by 20 per cent in those areas to cut costs. I wouldn't want to be living in Britain at the moment. I've learnt that you're even lucky to get police to come to your address if your home was broken into. Anyway, back to verse 11 of what we're talking about. 
So we've heard this before when it comes to these accusations, what was put against Stephen. Who did this happen to? It happened to Jesus. The servant is never greater than his master. Jesus said, what would happen to me would happen to you. We can't die for the sins of the world, but they couldn't bring Stephen down. They couldn't win an argument. They couldn't win an argument against Jesus. And when it came to speaking in front of the the public with Jesus, they wished they'd never entered into a dispute with him. But it was together, when it came to Jesus, together with witnessing his miracles, they never even came to a place where they had a change of heart and repented. But in Stephen's case, they certainly didn't want to be converted to be a Christian, but were offended. And they claimed he spoke against Moses and against God. So leave your finger there in Acts. We're just going to turn to Luke chapter 21. So Luke 21, verse 12. So Jesus forewarned the disciples of this, that this was going to happen if they were going to follow him. From verse 12. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You'll be brought before the kings and rulers for my name's sake, but it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which will, all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. So as you can see, this is already happening in Stephen's life. The Holy Spirit is giving him the words to say, but we're finding it's getting him in deeper and deeper trouble. So Stephen, though, he's not intimidated by the High Court. At first his speech appears simply to be a review, as we're about to get into, it seems to be just a review of the early history of Israel. But we should note this is this kind of kind of approach is that he's speaking their language, he's talking how they know. It's the normal style of the day. So let's we'll turn to Acts 4. So go back to Acts and we'll but we'll just go a couple of pages previous, Acts 4. Acts 4, verses 29 to 31. We're turning here because in Stephen's sermon, before this occasion happened in the synagogue where he was, he's having these charges put before him, the disciples came together. <clears throat> and in Stephen's sermon, it's an ongoing answer for the prayer for boldness. It was prayed when they're all in one accord. So if we go from verse 29... Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place they were assembled together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So we can see this... The how important prayer is, how important prayer was for the disciples at this early stage where they had these confrontations, these vigorous confrontations already, even before being put before a court. So let's go back to our primary verses. So we'll go back to chapter 6 and we're up to verse 12 and 13. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, And they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. Now if we stop right there, we see now that he's brought it before the people and things are getting stirred up, now there's new charges. Take note that this, it's not only against Moses and God, but now it's against this holy place. He's speaking against the holy place being a new charge. 
Well, this is similar to what happened to Jesus, of whom they said was speaking against the temple. Remember, that was a primary charge that came against Jesus in the early part of his ministry and then throughout. Now, Stephen is being accused of it before a court. He's speaking against the holy place and against the law, two new charges. Now, let's, we'll look into this for a minute. It's false testimony, but it didn't come out of nowhere. What did Jesus say about the temple? He said that God does not live here anymore. This house you've left desolate. Out of Matthew 23, verse 38, he says, See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you'll say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus was speaking to the, to the wretched heart of Israel. Everything the temple ever pointed to was Jesus. Now that Jesus is here, the temple is irrelevant. The new meeting place is not the temple. The new meeting place is the name of Jesus. Just like he said to the Samaritan woman, you can turn to John chapter 4, verse 21. When Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman at the well, we all know this discourse, when Jesus was even telling her, probably the first um, convert uh, in, when, in Jesus' own ministry, from verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, Believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So we're just going to spend a little time aside um, here where Christ speaks of the temple, the temple of his body. And this is raised very early in John's gospel and I believe it's raised for a very pertinent reason. So we'll turn to John since we're in John 4, let's just flip a couple of pages back to John chapter 2. And we're going to be looking at um, from verses 13. But while you're turning there, we'll just mention that this is the, uh, the well-known section of where Jesus is driving the traders out of the temple. He's actually in the porch of Solomon, the eastern side, termed the court of the Gentiles. It served as a symbol to all nations of the world were welcome. And Jesus was making it clear that the temple was meant for all nations, not just Jerusalem. So after he casts uh, the traders out, we can almost see it's a picture. It's a, a picture or a scene that we can see here. The traders have been cast out. The dust is settling. The, the cattle are still fleeing out. Money, the coins scattered all over the floor. Pigeons flying this way and that. And there's Jesus standing alone <clears throat> in that sort of midst, in that scene. Then the question is put out to him. We'll go to verse 18. In verse 18, it says, What sign do you sh show to us since you do these things? So the crowd, the Jews, Sanhedrin were bewildered by his capacity for such a righteous indignation and demanded a sign. It's a sign which he'd already given because his father's house, he said, you have profaned my father's house. But this was still not enough for them. So he gave them a second, second sign. Verse 19. Destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up again. So the people that had heard these words, they'd never forgot them. And we'll go to a few scriptures here where it, keeps, it gets raised a few times after that, but at very pertinent points. 
I believe the Spirit, the Holy Spirit imbued this to John as he wrote the Gospel and gave it so early in chapter 2 because it was very relevant to who Christ was and what the temple, who the, now the new temple is. So we'll turn to Mark chapter 14 verse 58. So we see, when we get there, so three years later, this is raised again at the trial before the Sanhedrin. They would bring it up again, but now in a slightly distorted form, accusing him at the trial of saying, they, they're repeating the words that they recall were saying in the temple that day. So they bring in a false accuser saying, I will destroy this temple made with hands and within three days I will build another made without hands. Then once again, uh, we'll turn to Mark 15, just flip a page over, Mark 15 verses 29. They remembered his words again as he hung on the cross in an attempt to mock him, remembering his temple purging and the sign he promised. So Mark 15, 29 to 30. And they that passed him by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. And even when the Sanhedrin, after Christ gave his life, his body, poured out his blood, that still wasn't enough for them. So even as they approached Pilate to take precautions in guarding his grave, it's like they understood by then, some of them at least, you can tell that he had been referring not just to their temple made out of stone, but quite possibly to his body. So we see in Matthew 27, verses 63 to 64, so when the Sanhedrin approach Pilate, they say, Sir, we remember that this deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. So going back to that discourse that happened in the temple when he gave his declaration, he was actually presenting them with a challenge when he said to them, destroy, destroy this temple. He did not say, if you destroy, he was challenging them directly to his kingly and priestly power by his crucifixion and he answered it by his resurrection. So for if David Yarwood, if you're out there listening and for other scholars out there, it's important to note that the original Greek used by Christ was naos, N-A-O-S, which meant the holy of the holies of the temple. So when Christ meant, said that, that's the word he was using, as opposed to Heron, H-I-E-R-O-N, being the usual Greek name for the temple. He was in saying, in effect, the temple is the place where God dwells. By my resurrection, I shall put all nations in possession of the new temple. Christ's body was a temple and the fullness of God dwelt therein. And at the moment it was destroyed, the veil that hung over the Holy of Holies, as we know, was torn was rent from top to bottom. And then the veil of his flesh that was also torn, it revealed the true Holy of Holies, the Son of God. So the Holy Spirit, I believe, brought this to the memory in John's Gospel. So if we just turn back to John 2, where we were getting this discourse from, from the, the temple when Jesus was announcing this, we see that the, John the disciple himself 
says in verse 21, we go there, that the temple he was speaking of was his own body. Verse 22, when therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus has said. So there the spirit had given, it's not something that John admitted there that it wasn't until the Holy Spirit brought it to their attention that they remembered what Christ had said, that he was the new temple. And in just short, and in another reference, in response to the Pharisees, when he and disciples were accused of violating the Sabbath, when they were in a cornfield in Matthew 12, 6. So there, there was no apparent trappings of glory there, but he responds to their accusation, to the Pharisees' accusation of why are you working on the Sabbath, when they were in fact um, doing temple duties on the Sabbath by lighting candles and, and those sort of things that bring the temple into its working function on the Sabbath, he's pointing, Jesus then answers them by pointing out, I tell you there, I tell you there is one standing here who was greater than the temple. So Jesus is saying amongst the cornfield, my disciples are doing more work, are doing the right kind of work because they're here serving the temple who was here just in this cornfield. So let's get back to Stephen's sermon. So we can see here, so we'll go back to Acts chapter 6. Now we can see here there's a, a clear picture of how the Spirit had illuminated Stephen's understanding of the new temple. So in Acts 6 we're going to verse 14 and 15. So when they heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth would destroy the place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us, and all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as a face of an angel. Let's note here that by the, trial, by the time of the trial of Stephen, Stephen is so full of the Holy Spirit, his face was shining like an angel. He was doing signs and wonders. The favour of God was upon him. With wisdom to the point, the Pharisees could not refute him or drag him down to their, their level. So we'll look at Stephen's response in chapter 7. So starting from, we'll go from uh, verses 1 to 9. Then the high priest said, Are these things so? And he, he said, Brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran, and said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I'll show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way, that his descendants should dwell in a foreign land, and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, said God, and after that they shall come out and serve me in this place. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. So you can see uh, this is the first sort of line of pattern in the response that Stephen's giving to the, address this synagogue. So this... Actually, it's the longest sermon in Acts, this, what, uh, this, this whole discourse of Stephen. It's, you can tell it's led by the Spirit, and it's, it's a sermon not long in the early part of the early church, but it, what's surprising about it, it doesn't even mention Jesus. Well, not overly. He doesn't mention the cross or the resurrection, the forgiveness of sins or repentance. So it's, it is quite a surprising um, sermon in that way but it does bring about the strong accusation of guilt. 
So, but we need to step back and even myself as I was going through this, studying this, you step back and you realise what he's doing. He's talking to very hard-hearted people. Some, would, some you know, I've heard some preachers say in, in, while I was listening to a um, preaching on this, some would say we shouldn't preach good news to, to hard-hearted people. Um, the good news, after all, is not for hard-hearted people. It's for the broken-hearted. Hard-hearted people need to be converted um, to have their heart broken by the perfect law of the Lord. For that is perfect for converting the soul. I'm not saying I necessarily believe everything that what, what's being said here, but we have to give a reason for our defence. But in Stephen's case, the hard-hearted people, and even in Jesus' time, they'd heard about Jesus' love for so long that it didn't touch their heart. It didn't mean anything to them. And we know that when we speak to some people today, when we try and give the gospel to some people, they just aren't moved by it and want to carry it too happy, not willing to even go down that line of, of uh, engaging you in conversation. I know we've all been there. So the problem comes down to the hardness of the heart. So that I am, <clears throat> I'm sort of saying to you though, or you out there listening, that I'm not saying don't engage with hard-hearted people. No, 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 do, do so. Do so on whatever moral topic or what's happening in the world today that's challenging them. We must give a reason for what they believe because it's the Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit and it's the power of the Gospel that saves. And it's that conversation that you've had, and I know it's happened to me a few times with speaking with people, it's a conversation that you've had with them on some topic that's a, you know, a bit edgy, a bit on a, on a moral vein or on science or something, but it's, that's something that has triggered them later, which has led for the power of the Word of God to then convert their soul. So I always encourage to still engage the hard-hearted people that you come across. But anyway, Stephen is giving them a defence. So he's speaking to the people of his day in the language and the style he knows and how the Spirit has led him. So he's basically saying, no, I'm not speaking against the temple. I'm not speaking against the law. It's in fact you are. You're the ones that are speaking against the law. You're the one that is profaning against God. In a, in a way, we see it happening today um, where there's this it's what's happening in America, day, America today and, and spreading across the world. It's like this mob rules, self-adulating uh, moral code that they've souped up. It's happening as we speak, you know, the street marches that are happening around the Western world. No one would disagree the abhorrent act and the wrong that happened that initiated all this, but we all know it doesn't justify the criminal acts of vandalism and looting that's going on where businesses are being destroyed and then you've got the Hollywood celebrities coming in on it, bailing out protesters in the wake of lauding themselves to be seen as doing good. And then the whole flip side is where you've, I heard a speech from uh, mayors from um, Los Angeles and New York who's stating that they're going to cut police budgets by 250 million and then redistribute that wealth to minority groups. The world is, is really turned on its head. We're calling, truly the days are here where we're calling what is evil good and what is good evil. If only the people of who Stephen was talking to and the people of today could comprehend the glory of the God, the God of glory, as Stephen opens in chapter 7, verse 2, where he says, The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. They knew this was taken from Psalm 29, verse 2 and 4, where the psalmist says, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The glory of God thundereth. 
The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. I've been reading the um, Psalms to my children at night you know, before they go to bed. Not every night, but as much as we can get to. And we got to about Psalm 8. And it spoke of the, the beauty of the Lord, the beauty of his holiness. And for a, a picture there, I, I, for a moment there, I got an understanding when it spoke of the beauty of his holiness, which is also mentioned in Psalm 96 verse 9 and Psalm 110 verse 3, that the splendour of his holiness is a greater beauty than even the glory of nature. And just for a moment there, I, I started to grasp that it's yet another character. We know that our Lord is holy, but just in that statement, if we can just pick up on that his holiness is a whole nother dimension and it's just something we can't understand and comprehend. We can look outside and see the beauty of nature, see the, the waterfalls, the mountains, and we, we understand that's the beauty of the creation. But to understand that his holiness, it's a whole nother dimension, it's a whole nother beauty for which we can reflect upon. And we have no comprehension, no understanding. So, it's just something I wanted to share with you because it was just something that really um, impacted me. Just I encourage you to uh, go through the Psalms. There is just um, so much there that uh, David certainly was a prophet. There's so much more there that we understand about the, the depth and the level of our Lord. So getting back to Acts where we were, chapter 7. So this is where Stephen follows the lineage from Abraham to Joseph, who was sold into Egypt. So we'll go now from verse 9, we'll start at verse 9 and go to verse 16. Okay. And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him and delivered him out of all his troubles and gave him favour and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now a famine and a great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard out that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers first. And the second time Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to send <clears throat> to him 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt and he died, he and our fathers. And they carried back to Shechem and laid him in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. So notice that it is through, so speaking of Joseph now, we notice that it's through jealousy. So this, remember, this is what Stephen's explaining, which the Pharisees and Sanhedrin already know this, but he's, ex, he's building now a pattern and he's explaining that it's through jealousy that Joseph was sold into Egypt. He was the one revealed to them through dreams that he was a prospective deliverer. God had revealed through the dreams that Joseph, their brother, was going to rule over them. He was a prophet from God. But Joseph was then rejected by his brothers, who were the leaders of the covenant community, and because of their jealousy, they sold him into Egypt. They rejected Joseph, but as we notice in verse 9, it says, but God was with him. So they were opposed to God. They were, in fact, rejecting his deliverer. So God's revealing a pattern here. Israel's first deliverer and prophet had initially been despised and rejected by the covenant community leaders and had been sold off, but had been highly exalted by God 
in order that he might deliver his undeserving people. You can see where Stephen's leading here with this, those that are listening. And then also, so speaking of Joseph, and although initially, initially unrecognised in verse 12, he was finally recognised by his own people in verse 13. It was a pattern for the future. So Stephen's revealing the pattern that Joseph was rejected is the same sin that they were doing, meaning the Sanhedrin, to Jesus, their Redeemer. Stephen recognised that the Jewish leaders were now putting their temple as an idol. They were idolising the temple and Jerusalem. So, So in their eyes, the Sanhedrin thought, so long as we have the temple, God is here. God, you know, we have that temple. God, we put him in a box and he's here. But that's, but holy ground, as we're about to see in Stephen's discourse, is wherever God is. That's why God's design was a tabernacle. The tabernacle's on the move. So God puts his holy, his holy place wherever he wants to put it. But before the tabernacle, there was the first circumcision. So it's his people. That's where God is. Like we could even relate it to in 1 John, don't have to turn there, but in 1 John 1, 1, we could reword it by saying, that which was from the beginning, which we had heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon, and our hands had handled. He had tabernacled amongst us. Jesus being the new temple was tabernacling amongst them. His life was manifested and moved amongst us. So Jesus, as the Father's tabernacle, was always on the move throughout Israel. So it was very probable, I think, that the most discerning of his audience, of Stephen's audience by this time, they were starting to get his drift. Like their forebears, though, they wanted no prophet, no one to rule over them. They wanted that mosaic law and they wanted that temple. So now Stephen introduces and spends most of his time on Moses. So we'll pick up now in verse, and still in chapter 7, but move on to verse 17 through to 29. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with the our people, and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they may not, might not live. At this time Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. Verse 21. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. This is very... So this is the part where... Stephen starts to preach Jesus. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and mighty in word and deeds. Now when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbour wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? Then at this saying Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. So here Stephen points out that it was, that it was Moses, when Moses, living in a foreign land, verse 21, and trained in all the wisdom of Egypt, verse 22, had risen as a deliverer, verse 23, and they rejected him also. 
Once again, you can see the pattern. As with Joseph, they'd rejected God's deliverer. It was thus that they who blasphemed God by rejecting the judge he had sent by rejecting Moses. It, again, it, it seems clear, it was coming across that Stephen's presenting, even though we say he's not preaching to Jesus directly, it is overly. So he's presenting Moses as a cameo like, of Jesus. Almost slain at birth, like Matthew 2 verse 16, a goodly child, Luke 1 verse 80, exalted and established away from Judea in the Galilee of the Gentiles with what the Sadducees and Pharisees would see as foreign teaching, mighty in word and deed, despised and rejected when he offered himself as a judge and ruler, driven away, but in Christ's, to, um, Christ's situation it was through his death, until God brought him back from the dead and established him as ruler and deliverer, performing great signs and wonders both before and after his death and resurrection and then leading his people into a heavenly kingdom. Stephen seems to continually stress that God's deliverers were not brought up in the equivalent of mainstream Judaism in the same way he wants them to realise the prophet who had come, who was like Moses, like in verse 37, was the man of Galilee, not the man of Jerusalem. So we'll pick up now on... Verse 30, so still in chapter 7, now going on to verse 30 to 35. And when 40 years had passed and an angel of the Lord appeared to him in, the, in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, when Moses saw it, he marvelled at the sight. And as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, and Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of an angel who appeared to him in the bush. So we take note there that we were talking about the temple before and where the Jews were seeing where God should be. But we can see here, um, Moses was commanded, take your shoes off. The place you are standing on is holy ground. Where? The temple in Jerusalem, it was a place where Moses knew of God's presence, but he dared not look. It was in the middle of nowhere. It was beside a burning bush. Why? Because that's where God is. That's where wherever God is, it is holy. A holy God calls for a holy people. This presented a Serious challenge to first century Jews. So jealous they were for this holy place, their temple. And, to, and it's really a message to all others, all of us, who cling to certain spaces or things of our religious heritage or what we believe to be holy. Let's move, move along. Chapter 7, uh, moving on from verse 36 to 37. He brought them out and after he had shown wonders and signs in, in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. Um, this is that that Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise you up a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. Now that's a, a point text that he's getting that directly from which is, we'll turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 15 to 18 is the direct text that Stephen is quoting from here. From verse 
from verse 15. The Lord thy God will raise you up thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken, according to all that thou desire of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Let's follow on from verse 38 to 43. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on the Mount Sinai with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey but rejected, and in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. As for Moses, who brought us out of this land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. So we can say, see here, remember Stephen is comparing them to their temple worship, in fact. It's when they're saying, you know, look at these stones, look at, look at this temple, isn't it wonderful? Stephen's now putting, putting it to them. You're being no different to how what the uh, Hebrews were doing when they were worshipping the calf. They're worshipping what they made out of hands and God's not there. Then God turned, in verse 42, God turned and gave them up to worship, the host of heaven, as it is written in the books of the prophets. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Rempham, images which you made to worship, and I'll carry you away beyond Babylon. So you can see Stephen and the church, the early church, they're now involved in a second type of exodus. Peter used this same verse in the second sermon of Acts 3, 22 to 23. So the implication here was that Israel was to expect another like Moses. So let's just, we'll look at what we mean by that. Let's look at, um, with this sermon that Stephen's delivering, and he's focusing a lot now on, Mo on Moses, and now you can see the comparison. He's bringing that comparison in that they just witnessed with Christ. So we'll look at some things on the surface. Not to say, it's not saying that um, they're exact parallels or or that this is what God planned and designed it, how it should be, but purely on the surface. So with like Moses, the Hebrews had to, it was, it was a long-awaited period before Moses the Deliverer came. Like when Christ was prophesied to come, it was a long wait. Moses was born under oppression. Jesus was born under the Romans and Herod trying to control the children of Israel. What did Pharaoh try to do when Moses was, was born? Kill all the baby boys. What did Herod try to do when Jesus was born? He tried to kill all the infant boys. But Moses was saved by the faith of his mother and father. So too Jesus was saved by the faith of his mother and father. Who took in Moses when he was a tender young boy? The Egyptians did. Where did Jesus go when Herod tried to kill him? The Egyptians. Out of Egypt I will call thy son. Moses was raised among the Gentiles. Jesus was raised among the Galilee of the Gentiles. In the wilderness, Moses called down manna from heaven. Jesus miraculously broke bread for thousands. Both would be despised rejected, performed signs and wonders and both would go away but the one, meaning Christ, whom God would inevitably raise up to be their deliverer and this is what Stephen is stating to them.
And that the finality Moses got between God and the people when God in his wrath, God wanted to start over with Moses. God saying, you leave me alone. Uh, Moses gets between God and says, if you're going to blot them out, blot me out. I'll take the penalty of their sins. Jesus gets in between the wrath of God and the people of God and says, I will take their sins. He was crushed and he was afflicted for us. Aren't we glad for the new Moses, Jesus, who is our deliverer? So over and over again, Stephen was pointing to the true deliverer, who Israel was now rejecting again and again, who has a pattern throughout the history of rejecting their deliverers that God had sent. This led to false worship and a constant breaking of the law. It was this spirit of idolatry that would eventually lead to the destruction of the temple and the Babylonian captivity, which was stated in verse 43. And in the same way, they would refuse to recognise God's righteous one. Stephen is now stating to them, you have re- it's you who have rejected. I've now shown you all the history that you know. You know all this, what happened with Joseph and now with Moses. It's now played out as a picture in Jesus. God was offering yet another chance to them to repent and follow Jesus. But even in Jesus' own words, we'll just, just quickly turn over to John chapter 5. Verses 39 to 40. And then 45 to 47. Even Jesus said to them, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think you have eternal life, and they are which have testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. Do not think I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For if you had believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. So if your heart is not right, it doesn't matter about the temple. If if you've left God like the West has, then you are nothing. God will let you go your own way to your own self-destruction, to a nation's self-destruction, as in Romans 21-23. As I said before, we're witnessing it now in in this worldwide phenomenon that's happening. If the biblical God is tossed out of your life, your family, your nation, as we're witnessing, then people will only replace it with their own version of what they see right in their own eyes. Let's go back to Acts 7, we're picking up again at verse 44. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David who found favour before God and asked him to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. So even though God did not require it, it, Solomon um, recognised it and he prayed with, even when the temple was finished, saying, God doesn't live in this house. And then Solomon ended up building a bigger house than um, than the temple. (laughs) as it says there in verse 47, but Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is the, what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all things? You know, do you think that man can build God a house and put him in a box? When he says, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. So Stephen was more or less stating Christ is the new temple. In him and in him alone can men approach God. 
His argument was Jesus was God's designated replacement for the temple. The final conclusion from his argument that man should look to God through Christ to the eternal tabernacle. So we'll pick up now in verse 51 to 54. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. So here comes Stephen's altar call. <laughs> Which of the prophets did your father not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by direction of angels and have not kept it. So who's blaspheming and breaking the law now? Who's coming against the Holy One, he's pointing out? You are, he's pointing back at them. You're laying the charges of me, but as I've just shown you through the pattern here, it is you that in fact is profaning the Holy One. It is you who have always tossed away the deliverer that God has shown in his patterns through Joseph, Moses, and now Christ. So Stephen, you can see now at this point, he's finished the sermon. He's full of the Holy Spirit. We could say so was Philip's ministry, but it's up to God what the results are. They're both, you could say, they're full of the Holy Spirit. Some say that Stephen's speech was too negative, and, but Philip's was positive. Stephen's face shone as an angel. The power of the message is in the gospel. God is sufficient to draw all men and women to him. So let's just come to the last section here of verse 55 to 60. But he, oh sorry, we'll go from verse 54. When they had heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? From the cross. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And that also sounds familiar. Words from the cross. And when he'd said this, he'd fallen asleep. So they're almost they're identical words that Jesus himself said before the Sanhedrin. Oh, I'm a bit of out of place there. Oh no. When, if we just go back to in that last discourse of Stephen where he says in verse 56, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. They're identical words that Jesus himself said in Matthew 26, 64, when he was also on trial before the Sanhedrin when he was asked the question, tell us whether you be the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus answered them by saying, that you have said it, nevertheless I say unto you hereafter, you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So we have two young men that are contrasted here. I consider they both saw the same thing, Stephen and Saul. Saul, could have seen it. Stephen fell asleep. But in the next chapter we see Saul seething on a path of whipping up destruction to the early church. So one guy's got peace and gone to be with his Lord. The other one, he's in sheer turmoil. One could say, Stephen, you should have preached a little different. You could have got someone saved. I consider that this was a catalyst that got Paul saved. 
Yes, he was knocked to the ground by the glory of Christ, but experiences and visions aren't going to save you. It's the incorruptible word of God that draws the brokenhearted, and then through repentance comes salvation. So Saul heard that. Saul saw that, what happened there with Stephen. And he came to a place. If Jesus is real, then the temple is worthless. If Jesus is real, he really was like Moses said he would be. If Jesus is real, then we really are pretty stiff-necked because he came to his own like Moses, but we received him not. And Saul came to that place, well, I'm guilty of all everything he just said. And that he was in turmoil. But he had that conflict. Who made this man meaning Christ, to be our judge. Who made this man to be our ruler, our deliverer, even to the point of being our Messiah? This ate away at Saul for weeks and weeks, even though it didn't appear that way from the outside when he was displaying his zeal to persecute the early church. It was eating him up on the inside to the point when the light, glorious light of Christ knocked him to the ground and said, it's hard for you to kick against the goads or the pricks. Meaning, it's hard to kick against that conviction that has broken your pride. But Saul was about to understand how much his life would change to be a servant of the Lord. When Jesus tells him directly, after he spent his time in Damascus, the last words Jesus spoke to him direct was Acts, 16, uh, Acts 9 verse 16. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And so it must be for all of us, to some degree, to take up our cross and to follow him. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for this message so powerful that we know that when we come... <clears throat> before you and when we speak your word that we need to speak with boldness. Let us be like Stephen, be like the apostles and have that courage from the Holy Spirit. Speak with boldness, speak the truth, and speak by giving the glory to Christ so that all sinners may come to him, whether they're hard-hearted, whether they're broken-hearted, whether they're lost and homeless. All, Christ loves all and wants all to come to him. So we offer this prayer up today, Lord, for the coming week and uh, have your name and your word close to our heart in his glorious name. Amen.